my name is A.D. James, and I'm the co-director of the Southern Hemisphere uh, Space Studies Program. Uh, and on behalf of the University of South Australia and the International Space University, I welcome uh, the SHSSP participants and our guests to this event, our astronaut and human spaceflight panel. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we gather here on the traditional land of the Ghana people and pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. So first thing first, some health and safety stuff. The toilets are down the corridor you came in at the bottom and then on the right. If an alarm goes off, I don't know what it sounds like, but it's going to be loud. And there's an if one fire escape at the top there on the left and two here. And finally, if you have your mobile phones on you, if you could switch them to silent or off, that would be great. The other thing I have to mention is uh, this event would not take place without the generous support of our sponsors. And for tonight's events, that's the Sir Ross and Sir Keith Smith Fund, Serafino Wines, and the Hawk Center here in making the Kerry Packer Civic Gallery available for this event and for the reception afterwards. So the Southern Hemisphere Space Studies Program, it's been in uh, Adelaide now since 2011. This is our seventh time here in Adelaide. And this year, we're pleased to have the biggest SHSSP we've had before. We've got 50 participants from 15 countries and they're all sitting down here at the front to talk to you. Now, I'd like to introduce you to the director of the program, Dr. Omar Hatamle, uh, and he'll be the moderator for the panel today. Prior to his current role with the ISU, Omar has held several senior roles in NASA, including Chief Innovation Officer for Engineering at NASA's Johnson Space Flight Center and Chief Associate Chief Scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. Uh, so, Welcome, Omar Atomley. Thank you, Ari. Uh, for those who don't know much about the Space Studies Program, Southern Hemisphere One, it's a condensed uh, five-week program that we bring participants from all over the world. And uh, we work and we engage in all aspects that have to do with space. It's an interdisciplinary program. That means uh, we go through everything that has to do with science, engineering, um, humanities, legal policies. So you get a whole overview about anything that has to do with space. Um, and today, specifically, is one of the public events that we typically like to do every year. We'd, we'd, we'd like to share some of the knowledge with the public and share some of the highlights. Um, and hopefully, that actually will entice some of the young generations and the young kids uh, to see the value in space and, and joining us and, and go to the study the hard sciences, the math, uh, the engineering, um, and become the future scientists, the future engineers, and the future leaders in, in space agency. Um, Australia recently announced it's going to be uh, having a space agency, so um, the younger generations will definitely have huge contribution to do that stuff. Uh, to start, um, uh, basically, we're going to do two presentations here. Uh, we're going to look at a presentation from both sides, from a management and from an astronaut perspective. And um, uh, Professor Walter Peter will talk about his, uh, his management side, and, and, and Dr. Yi will talk about the astronaut side uh, of things. Um, uh, after the, the end of the, um, the, uh, the presentations, there will be questions and answers. And um, also, there will be questions through Twitter. So if anybody has questions through Twitter, uh, please submit them, and we'll be happy to go through them as well. Uh, at the end of the event, uh, Dr. Yi will have a stand, and she'll be happy to take pictures and sign autographs for, for anybody that is interested in doing that. So to start, I'm going to introduce Professor Walter Peters. Uh, Professor Walter uh, Peters, he's currently the president uh, of the International Space University. Uh, he's also a professor of management and business there. He teaches several courses um, with all these um, uh, sciences. Uh, before that, he was a dean also of the university. And uh, Professor Walter uh, actually has decades of experience with ESA. Uh, he was, uh, one of his latest assignments was uh, in charge of the astronaut uh, center in Cologne. So he has vast experience on how tr uh, astronauts are being selected, how they are being trained, managed. Uh, so he has um, enormous experience, and he will be happy to share with that. Please welcome Professor Peters. Thank you very much, Omar. Let me first start. I, I like a little bit more, more flexibility than uh, standing behind this. Uh, if you are here, of course, you're interested in uh, going to space, otherwise you wouldn't be here, I guess, in this panel. So if you would be offered a short flight, how many of you would, would take it? How many of you would take a short flight? Let's, let's show some hands. 
short duration flight, well, I think half of the room. Well, then I have good news for you. I think according to some research, 83% of you can fly. <laughs> That's uh, so, it's not so dramatic yet. But if I ask you the other question, it's more difficult. How many of you would like to go to Mars? Some of them have already second thoughts, and uh, would, would, they think it's a bit long. There, I must honestly say, the news is not so good, because there will be not so many of you which can be selected for a long duration flight. And there is a reason for that. I have to explain you something which I think sounds maybe objective or uh, logic. It is the principle of select in and select out. Now, if you... For instance, Branson or somebody else, if he wants to have client, he will select out. Because why? He wants to have a maximum of people flying. So he will only take these people out where he thinks there might be an issue, medical or for other reasons. Completely different is the, is the philosophy if you want to have people from long duration flight or professional uh, astronauts flying on International Space Station or the Mir Station like Soyun. There you're going to do select in. And select in means that you want to minimize the risk that something happens. So it has nothing to do with all the people that can fly, but you're going to take all those ones where the probability that something goes wrong is minimum. So to give you some figures, uh, you can say that 6 to 7% of the people fall ill. Per, per, per person year. So 6 or 7% is our chance to fall ill. Most of the time not very dramatic, but 1 or 2% of the cases needs relatively invasive medical support. Now if you calculate that, that means that if you have a crew of 6 in, in, in space, every 5.5 years average, average, you would have to interrupt the mission to bring that person back to, to Earth. To, do a, uh, to bring to an hospital, for instance. And if you think about Mars, that's of course going to be even more complex to interrupt or to abort the mission. And that's why you do select in, that means you select only those ones which are, have the highest probability that they will have no problem. Now how do we select people? And if I say we, different per country, I can only talk about my experience for the European Space Agency, which is a little bit what most of the people are doing in, uh, in, in the context of the International Space Station. You can say that we select in a number of steps, as you can see here on the, on the top of, of the line. So first of all, we will make some requirements. We will, we will say we, we take people between that and that age, with that degree, and so on. And then the people can make a file and will send us a file, an online file, with all their data, medical history, uh, I don't know if there are many children in the room, but the, the, the marks they got at school, very important, so you have to study hard or you, uh, you will be selected out. Eh? So uh, don't, uh, uh, all your rest of your history. And those, on these files, we will, we look at a number of people to go through more intensive uh, training or selection. The basic selection goes in three steps in, in ESA. First, you, ha you try to do some basic, you invite a number of people and you do some basic tests with the people. Equilibrium, are they sporty, flexible, and so on. So you, you do a number of basic tests. Now you can statistically say last time we needed five astronauts then you can say that you pro, pro, plus minus you need 1,000 candidates. So we know we have some experience figures, so we are going for five astronauts, we will in that phase take something like 1,000 candidates. Because we know that roughly 30% will qualify the first step. So they will qualify for this basic type of uh, behavior. So you have 300 left. Then you're going to go for astronaut qualifications. That is, for instance, neurovestibular. What does that mean for the students know it? That is, how do you cope with G-forces? So we will put the candidates in a centrifuge. Some can cope with it, some cannot cope with it. 
So you, another 30% of them pass. So from your 300, you have 90 left. And then you do very severe medical and psychological qualifications. And there, there's always a lot of surprises that uh, some people are suddenly diagnosed with certain problems that they didn't even know. Uh, I have a few friends who went through the selection and suddenly they found out that there was something, it can be with glands, can be with something that is not serious, but serious enough for the medical doctors to say, no, the risk is there. So then you end up with a, with a group, 80% uh, goes through the medical, but you end up with a group that will be interviewed. And from those, you select. Now, what are the criteria? They, they change a little bit for, uh, from country to country. What are the criteria? There's one thing I must say, we, and we had a lot of problems with it, I don't know, in NASA, a bit of rigidity of the criteria. The criteria are nothing to do with somewhere that you want to exclude people or discrimination. The criteria are technical. Like, for instance, you have to fit in a suit, in an EVA suit. That means... We can extend and expand the EVA suits between 153 and 190. That's roughly 90 percent of the population. We like to have people between 27 to 37 with most of the time university degrees, minimum bachelor's degrees in medicine, natural science, or uh, uh, engineering. And then, of course, medically, they have to be in a very good health, in particular the vestibular uh, aspects which most of the time you don't know yourself. This is a real statistic, by the way. On the medical side, most of the problems that we see is either with the eyesight or with the cardiovascular, so with the heart problems. That's, that's where 80% of the people have uh, some problems to, according to our criteria. Do not take me wrong, that doesn't mean that a week afterwards they're going to die. Eh? <laughs> it just means that we see something uh, medically that we don't like and we say, no, no, we're not going to take the risk. And then, of course, psychological criteria, uh, very, very important concentration, uh, that you can concentrate on a job. We will give you something to do and then try to disturb you constantly. And if you get deviated, <laughs> bad luck. So, what is an astronaut going to do? And I'm going to show this person a few times on a purpose. Normally, in our system, we give the astronauts a one-year training. That is a little bit the same like ISU, but then a little bit longer than SHSSP. So, orbital mechanics, rehearsal of science, rehearsal of things, also media, uh, which I introduced when I was in uh, Cologne, uh, media exposure. Then the selected persons get mission training. In the case, if they go up with a Soyuz rocket, of course, in ZPK, which stands for uh, uh, Centrum Polgatovki Kosmonavtov, so the training center for uh, cosmonauts in Russian, which we call Star City. You know, you know that maybe. Roughly a year. And then most of the time they are qualified after these two years, and then they wait for a flight assignment. So they, they are given certain collateral duties. They will work in a laboratory like in NASA until they get a flight assignment. A flight assignment, then you know exactly what's going to be on that flight, so you get mission-specific increment training, roughly also one year, amongst others other places where the scientists have experiments which are going to be executed during your flight. Presently, the flight is roughly six months, and the post-flight activities are also very long. And I, that has a very consequence on today, because the, the person I wanted to have here, unfortunately, is not allowed to travel yet, because he's still in post-flight activities. Okay, so our astronauts most of the time go to Star City, because they will go with the Soyuz uh, uh, rocket, and then the first big obstacle, uh, and that I can talk out of experience is to learn Russian. <laughs> to learn Russian is not so evident. The first level is okay, but uh, to learn Russian very well is very difficult. So, Jan, <laughs> that you know as well. So, they will have normal training systems. They will talk about the thing. They will have this sort of, a lot of training in the Soyuz capsule. 
uh, how to behave, that's, that's uh, most, of, most of it. If you land somewhere, normally you know exactly where you land, but you can also land somewhere else. So they will also get a lot of survival training or EVA training. The survival training that you see here is using all the material that you have on board to make a tent or to go through the snow. And the, the Russians are extremely good in using all the material that is on board, like the parachute and so, to, uh, to, to uh, survive in an environment in case you are a little bit too far away from the landing that is foreseen. And then you have an increment training. That means you are assigned to a certain mission. So you will learn all about that mission. The scientific experiments, uh, mission-specific maintenance. Maybe you have to do something on board, change filters, but, or change something more complex. And maybe you have to do an EVA. So people will train EVA in this sort of environment, which is called a neutral buoyancy facility. That means... A, you float, so they put weights on you so that you float like in microgravity. Of course, the problem is that you have resistance. If you do this, you turn. What, you, what doesn't happen in space, that is, the, that is the little problem. Then, it's very interesting, you, if you are at the end of the training and you're going to fly, one thing you have to know, and this is, this is a fact, even if there are... Uh, Russians are relatively superstitious. So what happens is before the flight, they follow a very rigid schedule. Exactly the same before every flight. So first, you have to, you have to go with your crew and you have to put flowers uh, on, the, on the stone of, at, the Kreml, eh? at the Kremlin of uh, Yuri Gagarin. Then, before going to Baikonur, they, you have to sign a book here in the office where Yuri Gagarin was uh, last uh, working. They are then flown in two planes, by the way, for uh, security reasons. They are flown in two planes, so the first crew and the second crew, they fly, they fly in two different planes to Baikonur, which is the launch base at that, uh, for, for most of the astronauts. In Baikonur, it's also a very, very rigid schedule. Normally, they, they work a lot on drill rehearsals, so really the last minute, last minute, one after the other, that they are 100% sure it's in, their, uh, it's in their genes, what's going to happen during the launch and so. Five days before the, before the flight, the astronauts plant a tree. So they, the crew comes together and they plant a tree. Three days before the flight, that's the, long, that's the last time that they go out, they visit the little house where Yuri Gagarin slept before he went to the flight, and afterwards they go in quarantine. That means in three days, you assume that, they ca that it's far enough to catch something, that they don't bring something on board, like uh, a flu or I don't know what, and then they go in relatively in quarantine. And now you have a few interesting, uh, uh, a few interesting things happening. One day before... There is a blessing when the, uh, the, uh, the priest comes and, uh, with a bucket of uh, water. Most of the time when I came out, I was wet. Uh, they, they, they don't save on water. Uh, he, he goes around with his bucket and, and uh, goes a little bit wild around. I don't know, in your time as well. <laughs> and also very interesting is that the evening before they fly, or one day before they fly... All astronauts have to look at a movie. The movie is called The White Sun of the Desert. Now, the interesting point is, this was the movie that Yuri Gagarin loved very much. So you can imagine the trainers in Star City, they have seen that movie 150 times or so. <laughs> so every time somebody opens his mouth in the movie, the whole room is already giving the text. <laughs> it's, it's, very, it's very interesting to see it. Uh, when, some, somebody is thinking, is going to say something like that, and the room is, all the room knows the text already of what he's going to say two minutes later. That's an interesting experience. Also, during the day of the flight, everything goes exactly, exactly as, it, uh, uh, as it was in the time of Yuri Gagarin. So the rocket leaves the building at 7 o'clock. 
0700, exactly at 7 o'clock. Winter, summer, always at 7 o'clock. So it is pulled by a special uh, 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 train and goes out at 7 o'clock. As a guest, as one of the things, you are supposed to put a coin on the rails of the, of the, uh, of the rocket. And of course, they are relatively flat afterwards, you can imagine. And, but the astronauts and the co and are not allowed, and the cosmonauts are not allo allowed to do that. It brings luck. Uh, the Russians will never launch on the 24th of October. Never. Because an, an accident happened on the 24th of October, so they don't launch on the 24th of October. And then you, I, I found that personally also when, uh, very... By the way, if you see a crew, uh, I think the students here know it, but for the other people... If you see a crew just before the launch, that's not their lunch packet that they have with them. Huh? This, is a, this is a compressor, uh, j just to keep the, the suit for a few hours under, uh, under pressure. But what I found impressive from a management point of view, as Omar said, is that up to the last minute, they get a briefing and they can decide, or they theoretically can decide if they go or not, they must agree to go on the flight. Okay, I have shown the picture of this person a few times, which is uh, Paolo Nespoli. He's uh, an astronaut who was here in, it, in, uh, in Adelaide a few years ago, and he was very eager to come this time, but he's, he just returned. He landed on the 14th of December. He has a bit of a special pattern, and I'll tell you it because uh, he will also talk about it. In fact, he started his career in the military, uh, even as an NCO, worked himself up then as an uh, officer in, uh, uh, and was a specialist in parachute, uh, high altitude para parachute, high low, uh, they call it, high altitude low opening uh, parachute training. Uh, he then studied engineering after his military career, did a few engineering jobs, worked with me in the European Astronaut Center as a uh, and was then selected relatively late, if you look at it. In 1998, if you look at his uh, age, uh, he's born in 1957, uh, in Milano, by the way, uh, was then selected as an ESA astronaut and did three missions. One short one as a mission specialist, then one in ISS, and was very lucky that now recently, in 2017, he did the second mission in ISS, which means that he has total 313 days, which also means he's the European astronaut with the longest duration in space at this moment. So he wanted to be here today. He could not come here today, so I asked him at least to make a video, which uh, is, he made for you here. Hi, I'm Paolo Nespoli, Italian astronaut of the European Space Agency. And I'm sending you this video message from NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. A few weeks ago, on December 14th, I returned from Above Up, the International Space Station, after living and working in space for 139 days. During this period, I flew over your beautiful country, Australia, several times every day, and I was thinking about you. In fact, remembering my high-altitude parachute training, I even fantasized how nice it would be if I could just parachute myself down. 400 kilometers, though, are a bit too much. And I decided I should not risk it, at least for the moment. I think this was a good idea, since we were really busy carrying out all sorts of experiments, more than 200 in all possible scientific fields. Experiments carefully selected to take advantage of the unique environment only available on the International Space Station. All of them had the aim of advancing our knowledge to make life on Earth better, and eventually allow us to continue the exploration of our solar system, if not the universe. When my colleague and friend Walter Peters, president of the International Space University, asked me about the possibility of joining the astronaut panel, he was fully aware that this would be very difficult, mainly because of the technical and scientific post-flight activities fully taking up my days. These post-flight activities are necessary to collect essential data during the first weeks after landing. In fact, since my return, I've been going through a dense battery of medical tests and technical debriefings, 
and this will continue for at least six months. So while I cannot join you this year at the Astra panel at UniSA in Adelaide, I promise I will do all I can to be with you next year. On top of that, I understand So Young is there now with you, and you are in for a treat, since it's always interesting listening to her competent and clear answer. So, enjoy the Astra panel, take care, and see you. Now, Adi is going to introduce a real astronaut to come and present here. Thank you very much. Well, now, it is my great pleasure and honor to welcome to the stage Dr. Soyan Yi. Dr. Yi obtained a PhD in bio and brain engineering uh, from the Korean Advanced Institute for Science and Technology in 2008. But prior to that, in December 2006, she was selected as one of the final two Korean astronaut candidates. And on the 8th of April 2006, she became the first Korean astronaut as she headed to the International Space Station with cosmonauts Sergei Volkov and Oleg Kononenko aboard Soyuz TMA-12. She returned to Earth 11 days later. Dr. Yi has worked as a senior researcher at the Korean Institute of Aerospace Engineering and acted as Korean space ambassador. Recently, Dr. Yi obtained her MBA at the Haas School of Business, the University of California in Berkeley. Please join me in welcoming doctor and astronaut Soyeon Yi. I really, really appreciate that you come here and join us. And LA is, is kind of like mutual nowadays, uh, ritual for me. Almost every year I came here and I enjoyed a whole week or 10 days with the SHS, SP. So I feel like everybody knows Adelaide. So some friends of mine said, where do you go in Australia? Uh, Sydney or Melbourne? And, no, 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 Adelaide. And then they said, where? Oh, you don't know Adelaide? It's so popular <laughs> because I go every year. And anyway, it's so nice to meet you back. And then I can find a kind of familiar face also. And if, during the 10 day, except a really, really extreme heat, I feel like home. So that's a really, really un wonderful. And I really want to share, because all the technical things, how the astronaut was trained and then talked by the, one of the director of the national, so I don't have to add any more. But thankfully, he doesn't know what kind of things we are thinking about in space, <laughs> because he would never been, even if he's our boss. So I have a privilege to share those kind of things. And first of all, my selection is a little bit different of the uh, ESA astronaut selection process, because most of the uh, American and Russian and European and Japanese, they have a continuous human space flight program, so they try to uh, select the, most of the astronauts from the really heavy pre-requirement. So to apply for an astronaut, you should have some engineering background or flight time and so many things. Then they can just filter out a lot of people and only several hundred people can apply. But the Korean space program, Korean national program is a little bit different because they really want to pick the astronaut, but on top of that, they really want to make the huge STEM campaign nationwide. So they open to the whole general public, any Korean people who is older than 19 years old, and they believe that by themselves, healthy enough, and then, what else? Yeah, should have a Korean citizen. So those really big three requirements makes uh, 36,000 people apply for an astronaut. And then I was one of them. <laughs> I was so happy to survive until 300. And my goal was to make a 300 as a PhD student because make a 300 out of 36,000 is incredible. So I really want to write down one resume. I survive until 300 out of the 36,000 to apply my job after my PhD. So that was my ultimate goal. But it went a little bit further than I expect. So I survive until 30 and 10, and everybody around me knew that I survived until then, and my mom was so 
kind of surprised, not because I'm one of ten, but because I'm on the TV and I'm on the newspaper, because she would never seen that among the family or close friends who was on the TV and newspaper. And then she even take a photo of the TV at home to, to memory of, oh my God, my daughter on the TV. And <laughs> 2006 Christmas Day, Korean uh, space agency picked the final two out of the six, and I was over there. And maybe until now, almost 40 Christmas Day I get, and almost kind of less than 20 Christmas gift from the Santa Claus. But this one is the most biggest Christmas gift from Santa Claus, is being a final two out of the 36,000. That was the 2006 Christmas Day. And not only for a national, but also for an experiment, Korean government has a huge selection process. So all the engineering school and research institution and some kind of company research center, they apply for their own space experiment because it's the first in Korea. They really want to join those history event. And finally, Korean uh, Science and Technology Ministry, they formed a committee of the 20, 30 people, and they picked 18 of the several hundred. And that was designed by the incredible expert and scientist. So I had a huge trust for that because the experiment's not designed by me, but designed by the more smarter people. <laughs> there, there was a wonderful opportunity for me to learn about something different from my field. And one of the huge privileges of my flight was during the launch day, and I followed all the ritual things as the uh, Professor Peter talking about. We do the planting the tree, and I went to the graveside of the Yuri Gagarin, and some ceremony of the giving the watch, that watch we will use in a space station. I don't know why, but it takes only an hour to get the watch from the some people, and this watch is for using in space station. And signing on the book, and watching that movie, of course. But a little bit different from the former time is we got a blessing from the pastor it's right before going to the launch pad in the morning. And then he spread all the water in front of my face, and somebody is prepared for the towel, and we wiped out, and then going on the bus. And spacecraft launch is a little bit different in Russia because America and maybe France and Japan, when they... Uh, launch a cargo module or a human space flight, they always launch from their own home country. But Russia, they made a space center during the Soviet Union era, so they have a launch facility in Kazakhstan, so not in Russia. So security, security clearance process is much more complicated because you should go through two countries and you should go to the military kind of facility because nowadays the Russian space facility is under the civilian, but at that time it was under the military. So you couldn't know who will come, who will watch the rocket. But in Cocoa Beach in U.S., you can go whenever, and you can see whenever shuttle launch. If you want to go really, really close, of course you should have a security clearance, but it's quite close enough to see the shuttle launch. So if you are American or if you are tourist around the launch day, you could easily see the uh, rocket launch. But in Russia, it's not. And then all the Russian astronauts, they know who will come because only several hundred people can come. And then I checked all the name and my mom and dad, of course, over there and then some Korean delegation. But I've never seen her name, but she just comes up because she's the first female astronaut in the world and then almost like a national hero of the Russia. And then he, she holds my arms and she keeps telling me, Soyan, don't worry about it, it will be okay. Don't worry about it, it will be okay. And then I will be the person who will launch. So I will be the kind of feel so nervous and scary, but I was total calm. But she kind of trembling like, Soyan, everything will be okay. Don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And I look at her, I'm okay. <laughs> and she said, oh, everything's okay. And at the time, I was inspired really, really a lot because she's the kind of world hero. Everybody knows her if you like the space. And in Russia, whenever she comes up the TV, all the Russian people is, uh, look at her, oh my God, amazing. And then she's a wonderful woman. She's so charismatic and her readership is wonderful. And that kind of woman became a total grandma at the time because I'm the almost same age of the, her granddaughter. And then... Maybe here is a sum of moms here, and then thinking about in your position as a mom, you are okay to do anything. 
you can go work and then you can get in a trouble and whenever it's a hard time you can handle it as a mom even if the same situation or even less serious situation if you're daughter in there you start worrying about it so my mom is also the same my mom always trying to help us and then get through the really hard time and she have a really a lot of the kind of hard family background what something and she always said to me ah oh, i was okay and it was not that hard but when i packed the bag to go to the us to study and then everybody knows me everything's already and then it is not that dangerous and then she said oh, do you really want to go that would be really dangerous and then she was always worrying about that and when i pack to go to russia and she even worry more about that oh, russia Maybe all the people are really scary, and you know what? On the TV, everybody's a make a long line to buy the bread, and can you really eat over there? And you should pack something. Mom, I will go to the military base. Everybody guard me with a gun, so this is the most safest place in the world. So don't worry about it. So that's the mom's expression. So when mom kind of cooking, they can handle all the knives and then do some kind of dance with the knife. But when there's Dora has a plastic knife and do cut something. They say, "Stop! It's dangerous." So that's the mom thing. And she became totally my mom. And then, oh my God, everything will be okay. So I feel so close feeling. And another big huge feeling is, oh, astronaut is also humankind. It's not a superhero. It's not the person who just uh, coming from the heaven, or it's not any kind of different people like. Uh, Superman or Wonder Woman. She's also one of my people around me. And finally, I have a lift off and then go up to the space station. And wonderful experiment. Put your volume a little bit down. Yeah. And bring the 18 different kinds of experiment. It's all designed by the Korean expert. And then I was so stressful because I know how they feel. When I do my research, if some other people handle it, I keep worrying about that. Do they really do this correctly, or do they really follow my manual? But all those inventors and primary inventors, they stand with me, and then how much they worried about me. And then sometimes experiment was failed, or all the powers gone, and I should make a decision. Should I go back, or should I play again, or should I turn the power and then start from the, all the way from the first, or in the middle? So a lot of the uncertainty is going on. So I feel like I have a huge burden on my shoulder, because all 18 experiment was the baby of the, some scientist in Korea, and I'm kind of like a babysitter. They cannot never ever trust me. If you give the, your baby to the babysitter, even if they are incredible babysitter, you're always worrying about that. So that is the kind of like the scientific people's and researchers' expression. And of course, I had also fun. Even if I don't have enough time to having fun, I did my best because I love fun thing. And I had a meditation like a Chinese master. And I tried a flying kick because I'm a taekwondo player. I really want to kick the things like Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee and then want to be like them. And also, I'm the first Korean astronaut and representative of my country, so bring some cultural thing and national activity. And of course, all the Amer uh, astronauts are representative of humankind on the Earth, so we want to do some activity and campaign for the peaceful Earth. And I didn't forget to sing because it's one of my favorite things is the music and singing. Let me see you as spring is like a to be the end. In other words, hold the hand. In other words, now we kiss me. Feel my hurry song and let me see. Forevermore, you are all I long for, all I worship and adore. And I'm in other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It it was the very last night of my flight, so we had a kind of well, farewell, uh, farewell party together, and some of them should leave in space station 
six more months, and some of them should go down after their six months mission, and I should go down after my 11 day mission. So that was really wonderful time, and most kind of meaningful things, and, and cannot miss without sharing is looking down to the Earth from the space station because. As far as I met more than 200 astronauts, and almost 100% of astronauts, they always said that we would never ever get bored to look down to the Earth through the window whenever we go up. And Earth is incredibly beautiful and gorgeous because we were from there. And also, we always try to look down to the place we feel so familiar. Like when I arrived in space station first time, first thing is I really want to look down my country, Korea. And most of the American astronauts, they always try to find the state and city they are from. And they try to take a photo of the baseball stadium of their huge fan kind of sports team. Maybe if an Australian, uh, Australian national will go up, they try to take a photo of the cricket field and when they, their favorite team is playing. So that, that is a kind of typical action of astronaut. And why is really gorgeous and incredible? Why we never ever get bored, even if we look down to the for several hours? Because it's a live Earth. It's not a photo like you can see through the Google Earth. It's not a photo like you can see through the NASA channel or YouTube. It is a real thing. And of course, long time ago, 1960, 1970, most of the astronauts, when they have a media release and conference right after their flight, and typical words of the Russian and American astronaut was, you know what, Earth is the one blue planet. I cannot see any border. Or Earth is really one, and we should love each other, and we should keep the peace. And they have those old kind of diplomatical, political, <laughs> kind of statement they should have. But nowadays, astronaut in my generation, we cannot tell those kind of things, not because nobody wants us to say, but because we could see the border between the country, especially rich country right next to the poor country. Because of the electricity at night, you could see the clear border, how far the electricity go, and from here, no electricity go at all, because here is North Korea. And here is the South Korea, yeah. So I cannot tell that I couldn't see the border because I could see the border. And that's a really sad part, and that's because a lot of astronauts want to do something for making it better. Especially nowadays, it's not the good timing, it's really worse timing of around the recent, but hopefully we want to do something, we can do something, and then we'll be better. And that is the, my inspiration to think about my mindfulness from weightlessness. Why? And then I really want to ask some kids around there and the young people, and have you ever applied for being born in Australia before your birth? No, yeah. I've never write down the application for being in Korea. And I've never write down on any resume or essay for being born as my mom's daughter, but I can have incredible mom even without any competition. So that was an incredible blessing, and then I cannot appreciate enough at all. What if I were born? Oh, oh yeah. This place, because it's not my choice. And then, can I even study, or can I even survive until now? And can I even imagine to be an astronaut? Totally different situation, even if I did my best. And some kids were born in Africa or somewhere their IQ would be higher than me, but they cannot even still survive. They cannot even imagine to study in this kind of wonderful program. They cannot think about the astronaut panel, and they cannot have even worse air conditioner, even if it's crazy hot. And we always have the cell phone in our hands, and then on the way here, three among us talking about, yeah, everybody looking down to the cell phone, and then nowadays the culture is totally different. But still, some of people doesn't have vocabulary cell phone in their own language because it's not exist in their culture and in their country because of the technical hard time. So that was the most biggest inspiration of mine. Oh my God, how blessed I am to be born in my country, to be born as a, my mom's daughter, my dad's daughter, to be born as a friends of my best friends, 
and there is an education system I can apply to go to the school, even if nobody loves their country's education system, and even if everybody hates their own politician, but at least we have a country and politicians and politics and something going on, even if we never ever satisfied, but it's better than none. Yeah, some refugees, they don't have a country, they don't have any politicians to speak ill of them. Yeah. So whenever I feel so angry, for example, I'm from Seattle, US, and then actually when I moved in five years ago, we don't have that much traffic jam, but now there's a crazy traffic jam and I'm complaining. And then my husband said that, Soyeon, this morning you have a talk, you have a presentation to the primary school, you should be grateful for everything. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, I said that. Oh. And then whenever, whenever I see the traffic jam, I say more like, oh, thank God I have a car to drive. Thank God I live in the country who has a traffic. Because when I went to the Mongolia, whole big country has a one highway only one highway. So they don't need a GPS. They don't even need a map because only one highway. So driving the one highway, in the middle of the highway, you feel like here's the place and then you get out of the highway and then driving the off-road and then should find your friend's cabin and then should find your friend's tent. So think about it. How grateful for having the traffic. How grateful for having those kind of problems. So that is the most mindful things from the space, if maybe if I didn't go to the space, I couldn't even cannot realize it. Maybe I would be more arrogant to take everything as granted. So that's the thing I really want to share with you. And thank you so much again to come to this place. And that's a bonus video I really want to share. I love a happy ending, so my talk was serious. Thank you very much. During his presentation, Professor Peters uh, talked about contingency plans and, and training in case uh, landing doesn't happen as scheduled in the same location. I understand when you were landing, um, there was some, some issue, and you guys <laughs> had to deviate from the loca original location. Maybe you can share with us uh, this afternoon, you know, some of the things yeah, that right, happened. Yeah, right, yeah, right. And then we had this kind of situation, problem with the separation and smoke inside, and it feels like we have a fire inside, but luckily, finally, we figure out it's not a fire, but all those problems happen. But only thing I really want to point out in this thing is, I was a right set, but Discovery Channel guessed that I would be the left. And then Yuri Balenchenko was in the middle because he was the commander, but in this documentary he's the right side. So that, that is a little bit different, but pretty much all the contents is the same I had experienced. So mm. finally we land on the 500 kilometer from the designated area. And then in normal landing, during the descending, once you get through the atmosphere, several helicopters escort you. And then once you touch it down, such a rescue team come and open the hatch and pull you out and they can make us sit on the chair. And you, some of the ISU people are already learning the lecture. So sit down and then take some rest and checking all the Medicaid things and we go back to the uh, Moscow. But in that case, we didn't have a such a rescue team because we have all antennas burnt out. We had a problem. We was out of the range of the radar. So such a rescue team and mission control doesn't know we, where we were. So they just waiting for the signal, but we didn't have any signal at all. So in Korea, some Korean government people uh, kind of already prepare for the worst case scenario. What if the first Korean astronaut passed away? <laughs> Could be killed. And how much insurance should we pay for a family? And then kind of things, a meeting going on. And then in mission control, they try to find all the people because they cannot be sure if we are alive or not. But finally, we realize that mission control doesn't know where we are. Because first time, we feel kind of naive. We feel like, ah, maybe they wouldn't know where we are. So we're just waiting and waiting and waiting on the plane, on the kind of grass. 
But at some point we will realize, what if they don't know where we are? And we try to find the Iridium uh, satellite phone and find the GPS and checking out where we are and then call to them. And then finally one helicopter make because we are too far away. Small little helicopter cannot make. Only one helicopter has a huge tank. They can come. So we don't have any recliner chair and we don't have any enough medical people. So we just hop in the helicopter and then coming back. So, but I feel also appreciate and then feel so grateful for this accident as far as I survive. <laughs> because among the whole 500 astronauts, I'm kind of a small little young woman. And only 11 days flight, you see the Paolo Nespoli, he flight more than 300 days. So I feel really small. But thanks to those accidents, all the astronauts come to me, Soyeon, what happened? How did you do that? And they really remember me and recognize me as, oh, thank God. That's really good to have an accident. <laughs> and some of you already have a military experience. And you know what? Any military guy who had uh, some abnormal situation, they became really hero. You know what? I had this kind of accident, but I saved all, everybody and then come back home. But I was not that kind of person. But we have some kind of pride of survive people after those accidents. So that also helped me a lot to working as an international uh, society of an astronaut. And wherever I go, most of the astronauts, oh, you are that girl who survived from those accidents. So that, that's also in other part, I feel so grateful. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, while we're getting some questions from Twitter as well. You spent 11 days in space. How long would you like to have been there? At the time, I want to stay in space station six months because all my colleagues plan to stay six months. So I really want to stay with them as much as possible. But at the time, longest was the six months. But now some astronauts go one year. So it means one year would be also possible. And now Mars exploration, everybody said at least 500 days. So <laughs> I really want to go kind of one and a half years or two years. So as long as possible. But I know my mom hated. <laughs> so one of the Twitter questions is Professor uh, Peters. Uh, the question says, can an Australian become an astronaut for NASA or the European Space Agency? Mm. Oh, that's a difficult question. Uh, for the European Space Agency, like a bit like in Korea, you'll have to be a member of uh, your country from the European Space Agency, unfortunately. Uh, NASA is a little bit more flexible if you studied in, uh, and, and you, have the, you have a green card. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, like uh, Andy Thomas mm -hmm. was born in Australia and uh, flew with the European Space Agency. Okay, maybe I can give a message. There is a very easy way to convince your, uh, your government to join ESA. You, <laughs> you, you were an associate member of ESA. You're not anymore, so why don't you do it again? And then you can become an astronaut. <laughs> maybe, yeah. yeah, basically it's not easy to be an astronaut if you are not belong to that country because as a common sense, if you becoming an astronaut, automatically they became a national hero. But any kind of government agency want to pick the foreigner as a, their national hero, it's, it's a little bit tricky. So most of the American national who was not born in America is most like a dual citizen yeah. or grow up in U.S. Because basically America is a melting pot and not many people are originally American. Yeah. So that's possible. But all other countries, very, number one thing is it should be the citizen of that. Any questions from the audience? Okay, another question here says, what was the cause of the loss of momentum in manned spaceflight missions after the Apollo era? Do you think we'll ever get to that back? Mm -hmm. I, know. I, I think I can, I'm going to start maybe with, with that one. Um, the intention of the space shuttle program was actually, it had one specific uh, mission, which is build a space station. The space station, as you know, is the biggest international lab, at, and we're uh, learning things every single day about science, about the human behavior, uh, we can't send people to Mars for a six to eight uh, month mission without understanding what's long term implications in the human body. And we're learning a lot about uh, combustion, we're learning about, about proteins, uh, 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 human behavior, psychological behavior. 
So all that stuff would not be possible without having this international lab. So the intention of the space shuttle was to do that, and now we finish the, the International Space Station, and uh, we give that uh, low Earth orbit, what we call it, into the commercial, and we're going to go into beyond. So we're building currently the Orion and the SLS uh, rockets to go beyond the uh, low Earth orbit, go explore Mars or the moon and uh, anything that's going to be beyond the low Earth orbit. So it's not like we've lost momentum. It's just a phase that's going to uh, go to the next mission. And because I'm not belong to any, any country's kind of government agency, I can be more straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> And most of the time, space flight is really, really pricey. And then you should have a several billion dollars and million dollars. So if you are not an Elon Musk, you cannot do the by yourself. You should convince your taxpayers and politicians and everybody. So think about it as a politician. They really needed to spend billions of billions of dollars, but no general public interested in And then if they really want to spend it. I don't think so because they should think about next election. They want to be popular to do something really popular thing. So as a president or as a congressman, if the general public is not interested in, they don't want to spend any penny at all. So Apollo mission also, think about it. First Apollo mission, everybody watch TV. Second, everybody. Third, ah, again. <laughs> Fourth, ah, oh, still. <laughs> and fifth, oh, still they sending the astronaut to the moon, why? And then, oh, they are wasting our tax money. And then not that many people are watching TV. Then politicians decide, uh, I better not spend money. I don't care about the output of the scientific. I don't care about the whole achievement. I should care about my next election. So that's the kind of sad part of the, a lot of space flight and space activities. So I always tell Korea's younger generation, please be smart, elect right person, make them make a better decision, that always the right answer, I believe. Yeah. Well, uh, the International Space University is intercultural, interdisciplinary. Um, so Walter, you, you mentioned um, uh, through the training that you had to deal with different people. Maybe you can tell us about what was the biggest challenge in your job when you had to deal with people from different cultures, different backgrounds, different disciplines. Maybe you can shed some light on that. Uh, no, but of course, we only had the European astronauts, although there are different cultures. I, I, I think the biggest problem I had to deal with uh, managing astronaut business was to deal with the last ones who didn't, were not selected. I mean, if you apply for a job and they don't answer you, okay, tough luck. But if you go through all the steps and then at the last moment they find something, with these people, they were very, very disappointed. And, and up to, uh, uh, and it was some, uh, most of the time, and that is, I think I'm, I'm going to use it as a message, it can depend on something that is not invasive. It, it is not very, very hard, and it's not influencing your, thing, but you must be lucky to be selected with this process. Uh, if, I, if I do it very personal, to give you an example, I am, I'll show you, this part of my legs is too big. <laughs> well, I have no problems with it, but it means I don't fit in the Soyuz. So I was deselected for the, for the Soyuz thing. So it is an anthropomorphic, or it's a very small anthropomorphic, is the different uh, uh, measures that you have in, in the relations. It can be something very strange, very simple, which is not life-threatening, which is not important, but these people often have very, very big difficulties. But the first time I was involved in the selection, I had 43,000 candidates. So the only thing I could do was black and white. So some people went to the doctor and said, I have 10 out of 10 on one eye, 9 out of 10 on another. I, I could also fly, yes. But you cannot make exceptions because then you open the box of Pandora. And these last people, we had serious, serious problems. And then... They, they took a good lawyer like Michael, and then we really had problems when, when, they, when they started to sue us and say uh, that they also could fly. So the most complex things I had to, to, to handle was always this last group, which, which we had to say, no, you're, you're, not, you're not qualified to fly. That was, that was often very emotional and difficult. Thanks. No questions from the audience yet? Okay, there you go. Keith.
world or life in... Sorry, thank you. I'll, I'll ask that again. Uh, is there a perspective or a, a view of the world or life in general uh, that you believe that you have now as a result of your space mission that you would otherwise not have uh, um, by not going? Yeah, so that's the thing I talked about at the end of my presentation. Yeah. yeah. I was kind of like arrogant. I thought like all the things I have is a, a kind of result of my effort. And, but I realized that something I already have is not from my effort, not from my something I already done. It's already given. And that's the incredible open my eyes. And then I'm thinking about the person who couldn't have because, not because of their fault, but because of just situation or system. And of course, I cannot help them like a Bill Gates, but at least I can think of them and always have a headache. How can I help them? And how can I make other peoples to move to help them? And as an astronaut, a little kind of more influential if I have this kind of talk and you can think about it at least one day, <laughs> at least several hours. And Whenever I have a fundraising or do something in a goodwill, maybe a little more influential. So sometimes I feel so bad. I want to be more powerful to change something, to help people, but I cannot. But in the same time, if I'm a powerful, am I keep being that nice or <laughs> corrupted? That's the also question. So sometimes seeing more and knowing more, not always good because I have a huge conflict in my brain what if I didn't go to the space? Then I don't have to have this kind of headache, and I would be more happier. So they always fight against each other. So I don't have exact answer, but yeah, that changed my life and that changed my view. Yeah. Thanks. I think we have a question from a gentleman, in the, uh, a mm -hmm. young lady. Uh -huh. At what age did you decide you wanted to become an astronaut? Ah, uh, I. I flew when I was 29, and I applied when I was 27. Even when I applied for an astronaut, I didn't decide because I'm not the person who can decide. I just think, what if I apply? And maybe most of the Australian can sympathize with me more because Korean government doesn't have an astronaut program. How can I dare to dream? How can I dare to decide? I cannot even imagine until I read the newspaper, Korean government start looking for an astronaut. So what if I can be an astronaut? Those kind of questions was coming around 27 years old. And if you think in that way right now, you are quite lucky. And you have a better position than me because I couldn't think about that. Thank you. Professor Peters, beside being, you know, talking about citizenship, you have to be from certain places. Based on your experience, a lot of young people want to aspire to become astronauts and go to space. And what would you tell them? There are some of the skills that are needed actually to get a competitive advantage uh, through the big pool of people that typically apply for these programs. First and all, study. <laughs> study well, have good results. Second, take care of your health. Uh, you can do some stupid things when you're young. I also did it. Uh, maybe too many uh, watch out with smoking watch out with drugs you will not pass the test uh, so be careful as a, as a youngster if you want to become an astronaut live a normal life but live a healthy life study hard make sure that you have good exam results the rest is a bit of probability the rest is a bit of luck if you're selected and if you're not selected Okay, as a secondary advice also to the, to the students here, if you're not selected, don't, don't keep hanging on it. Go, go ahead, do something else. Also the ground, the people on the ground mm -hmm. are equally important than the people in space. So don't get very sad and ruin your life if by any coincidence you're not selected. Yeah, astronaut also has a boss, so you can be a boss of astronaut, <laughs> <laughs> even if you are not qualified. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have another question from Twitter. Uh, Soyeon says, uh, what was the scariest moment for you during the mission? Ah, oh, yeah, I have a scariest moment during my mission, and it was the right before my launch. 
that if I answer until this, everybody think, oh my God, yeah, right before launch, it would be really scary because huge engines burn and kind of thing. But not because of that. But because right before launch, we had a problem the very first time. And our commander's flight suit, uh, space suit has a problem, so it's not, uh, it's the jeepers cannot go up and then cannot make a pressurized well. Even if we passed all the tests, but right after getting inside of the capsule, we found out the problem of the space suit, yeah. So we check in again, try again, and it takes a little bit of the time. And that is the most scariest moment because all three of us, what if we cannot go because of this uh, suit problem? So from then, then, that time, we are almost like a students of ISU to build the Goldberg machine. Mm -hmm. Because where is the kind of thread, where is the something to help him to tie enough? And we check the pressurized check several times, and then is there any oxygen leak, or is there any air leak? And we do our best for 15 minutes to make his suit fly, and then safe enough. And then outside of the space capsule, all the Ross Cosmos and, and Korean peoples, they have a serious meeting. Is it okay to make them fly or not? So it was the most scariest moment at all. What if we cannot fly because of that problem? And Thank you. you should also know that in the Russian system, if somebody of the crew has a problem, the whole crew is changed. Yeah, right. <laughs> so uh, I know a few of my uh, friends in Russia who really were very unlucky. If something happens with somebody else from the, from the crew, like a flu or something like that, they, they exchange the crew by the backup crew. So I can yeah, 100% and then you should uh, go all understand. the way back of the line. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so uh, you can understand why yeah. uh, that, that's, that's very scary. Okay. Maybe one, one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, has uh, your, the, um, the other Korean astronaut, has, uh, has he had a chance to fly yet? But by the government decision, we only have a one-time project. So they decided only one person flew, and they don't have any follow-up plan at all at that time. And that, at that time, I realized that even if media and everybody guessed that maybe we will have another Korean astronaut soon, and maybe we will keep doing that, but that is only the general public's imagination. Real political side and government side going on is very official and very kind of systematic. So it doesn't change at all. And then I realized that, oh my God, I should pick the right person to make a decision for next person and next flight, yeah. So we couldn't make yet. And hopefully we will have another person or my next flight, either way around, I don't care, soon. And then I always cross my finger. And then I told my boss when I left Korea, whenever next astronaut project coming on, wherever I am, how much salary I got, I just quit it and then come back to the Korea. That was my promise. All right. Well, I would like to thank all of you guys for joining us today, and I would like to thank also our distinguished panelists here, Professor Peters and Dr. Yi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for everyone attending tonight. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to thank our, our sponsors for the event and for the whole program. Without the sponsors, these events would not happen. It's very difficult to do. Uh, so there's some other events that we're doing. Uh, so look out for those. Um, all that's left to do now is uh, Soya and you will now assign in photos down at the front here. Um, so if I could ask you to form an orderly queue, but if you could give a couple of minutes just for families with children to get down to the front first so that they can get theirs done early, that would be great. Um, then I would like to invite you all to join us for refreshments in the Kerry Packer Civic Gallery. So if you go up the stairs here and through the door at the left, there are some refreshments for everybody. And that's it. Thank you for coming. And one more time, if you'd like to thank our panel.